so imagine a shipping company. What does a shipping company want to do? Well, of course, they want to get into the word world of mobile. They want to get in the world of, you know, they've done their first effort. It failed massively, let's say, horribly. Um, delivery time and adopting change internally. It's a large organization. Shipping companies generally are. You can name a couple around the world there. You know that they're large. You know that they are, have speed to time to market issues. They want to diversify. That's a really important point. Diversify their network. So not just branded storefronts, get into the world of uh, working with partners, working with affiliates, working with multiple organizations. And they've got a real desire to get that customer facing experience. Now, back to what Ronnie was talking about. Back to the getting the empathy with that user, right? So you want to have it so that their experience, that user experience, is the kind of positive experience that you want to start providing. Again, they tried it once. First mobile app didn't work so well. So let's talk about getting into the, uh, a more user-focused experience. And the last point we want to make is that tracking packages. Where is my package? Why is it not here yet? Why is, where is it? What depot is it sitting in? That kind of thing. So, we've composed this stuff. There's a customer service piece there's a, and the shipment details. So, where is it and who am I? So, we wanted to have a first uh, experience, like a first page experience, if you will, of your website or your first, first screen experience of your mobile app. That's what we tried to, mobile, to um, model here. Now, if you look, a couple pieces that really should stick out here is that these things aren't customer focused. These are the services. This is what's behind it. But we have to compose what these APIs look like in terms of the user experience. So that's a big portion of what we're going to do here. We're going to talk about the endpoint and the number one feature that we want to look at here is right there, the profile and the shipments endpoints. We take a look at that. That starts to inform really what we're going to do. So here's what we're going to do for a flow. The user opens the app, and it implicitly calls a preference to service. Who am I? Get myself logged in. And then from there, what are my open shipments? What are my top 10 open shipments? So how am I using this thing? How, what is my experience? The user experience needs to have it so that that within the first couple of milliseconds of that app coming up, there's something useful on the screen. And that's what we're modeling here. And then, from there, we can get into more specific things like the specific orders and things like that. But that first screen is a crucial part of it. Now, the last thing we do is we throw in a tiny bit of a grace note here where we use a capability that's been in the Gateway product for some time now, which is making back-end calls in parallel. So we're going to be taking the top 10 shipment and issuing to 10 different servers simultaneously. This means that the maximum amount of time taken by those back-end API calls is going to be the maximum of those 10 calls, not the sum of them. The last slide was important because, um, as Jay pointed out, uh, when I was setting up this, uh, like what goes on in the demo, I only told you two of the things that the gateway does for the microservices, right? I told you about the security and I told you about service discovery through integration with the standard service discovery tools that people use normally in the microservices world. But the third very important part is orchestration or uh, Jay likes to call it composition. But the point is that in the microservices architecture, it's very important to understand that your microservices are not necessarily the public facing APIs. They can be. Uh, it's a good idea to design them that they may be public facing APIs if that's, the, if that's what you need. But as you looked at what the APIs do in our design, you notice that they're very granular, right? To make them reusable, they have to be very granular. They do very specialized things. But what does the application, the iOS application or the Android application that we're actually building require? The iOS application needs to show me all the shipments for a user that are ongoing, 
and the latest state of those shipments. None of those backend services provide that, right? What these backend services provide as they were designed shows you the profile of the user, so you can see the IDs of all the shipments. And then if you want the shipment details, that's actually a completely different microservice, right? Because that's a different capability. I mean, if you start putting everything inside one microservice, that's gonna be a monolith, right? So you have to be very granular there. But the end client, for the end client, that granularity is gonna be complexity, right? So end client wants to make single call. The end client does not wanna make 11 calls of give me all the IDs of the ongoing shipments, then I'm gonna make n number of calls to get the details for each one of them, and by the way, this, um, these calls are gonna contain the full history of the shipment, right? Uh, have you ever used, like, I cannot name any companies, but you've definitely had something delivered to your home, right? And when you go to this website with Ship Inc., Right, when you go to this website, you will see that it's in Philadelphia, it's in Kansas, now, now it arrived in San Francisco, things like that, right? So it has the full history. But the application does not care about that. They only care, where is it currently? I don't care as a user, like the way my product manager de defined it, I don't care where it was yesterday, just give me the latest because I have small screen. If the iOS developer has to make 10 calls instead of one, and if they have to get one megabyte data, in the payload instead of 50 kilobyte they could be getting. How happy do you think an iOS developer is gonna be? Have you, have you ever worked with those iOS developers when you tell them you're gonna get a lot of data and you are gonna have to make a lot of calls from your uh, native application? They are pissed. Like, they hate your guts pissed. Like, it's, it's the worst conversation you can ever have as an API producer, right? So it's very important to create APIs that are tailored to them without necessarily always writing code for that. So that's the composition part that we allow without writing any code, give them one very custom tailored, very lean call, while our backend is very reusable and very granular, right? So let's look at this. There's one other point I wanted to make about uh, API calls and why to compose them like this. And that is the fact that, let's say your user is in New York and your data center is in San Francisco. Um, last th time I checked a, a certain website that I use, it's 77 milliseconds between um, San Francisco and New York. Do you want to pay that 11 times to show one screen of data? You don't. You want to pay it once. 77 milliseconds you can't get rid of. That's an important point. That's why composing APIs, especially for that first screen full of information, starts to make a whole lot of sense even more so in the mobile case. Probably the most in the mobile case. Thank you, Jay, that's a, that's a good point. So again, uh, the entire source code of this demo is available. Uh, as you might guess, the URL for the Docker container of the gateway is encrypted, as are some passwords that we're using to access it, because it's not a, it's not a public product yet. But everything else up to that point is open source, so you can definitely see how things are getting together without or necessarily being able to download the alpha version of a, of a product. Um, as I said, uh, Jay and I were not the only people putting this uh, demo and we wanna acknowledge and thank Ryan Blaine and Heinrich Budo from the product team of the Gateway that played instrumental role in helping us build this um, more enterprise version of the demo. So the first thing I wanna show you is this is what the service discovery looks like. So this is the console, right? And this is also part of the reason why you, wanna, you don't wanna deal with it directly, right? You want something like API Gateway so you can say things like, I wanna access the user microservice, I wanna access the shipment microservice. You don't wanna be like looking at, so it's deployed on three, API, uh, on three IPs, on three servers, and by the way, the services, when they're deployed on the same host, Obviously, 100 different services cannot be served from the same port. So you have the variety in IPs and then you have variety in the ports. So in our case, the um, customer microservice is deployed on 20, uh, 32768 port and uh, the uh, shipments is deployed on 32769. Uh, you don't wanna be coding those things 
in your client code, right? You don't want to be exposing this complexity, not to mention that containers are supposed to be ephemeral, right? So to be resilient to the, uh, to the uh, failures, we assume that any of this will fail, right? That's why you see the health checks. So the picture that is true now may not be true five minutes later, right? So, um, so this is the backend service. Uh, that you guys can see, yeah, it's pretty visible. This is the backend service. Uh, I opened the port so we can see uh, what the backend looks like. It's the microservice output of specific shipments details, right? If I want to see the details of a specific shipment, this is what it looks like, the history, some metadata. Uh, this is the microservice, again, the backend service of uh, uh, the customer profile, which includes the IDs and the links to the list of the shipments, right? This is how things are granular. This is generated data, this, these aren't real people. Yeah, yeah, this is <laughs> all fake data. Um, we have a home microservice that lets you like discover, it's an auto discovery API, obviously we're API Academy, we have to design nice APIs. This is the view, so this is, now we're looking at the routing part, right? So for accessing the backend services, you had to know that it's the specific uh, uh, port, and I had to find the IP that actually this microservice is on right now. Whereas with the gateway, once we're accessing the same thing from the gateway, you can see that the IP is always the IP of the gateway. I don't need to know what goes on behind it. And obviously we can deploy load balancers and make it a domain, not the IP, the usual thing we've been doing forever. Um, and the port is whatever the main port for your gateway is, right? For simplicity, we took 8080. In reality, it's gonna be port 80, so no port to worry about. But you see that the gateway is dynamically routing. I'm gonna click it so you make sure you don't think it's a screenshot, it's an actual API call. Um, and uh, you can see that uh, the uh, IPs in the output of the API, because it's a self-discovery API, were also overwritten. So the client is always remaining on the view of the, of the gateway and the single host name. Doesn't need to ever know about ports or anything like that, even as you're jumping from one microservice to another. Same, this is the going through the gateway view of the shipments uh, microservice. Same data, but you don't have to worry about the complexity behind. And then the last part is that composed API that Gateway allowed us to create, right? That one call instead of 100. So this one is uh, protected by authentication, right? Um, for the purposes of this demo, the backend services I just opened up, right? So we can see it easily. Normally they are probably not even accessible directly. You have to go through the gateway. They're typically behind VPN in the, in the, in the uh, demilitarized zone, all that usual security stuff. But obviously this public facing API is gonna be on the open, so you have to authenticate so I think we're doing here uh, JSON tokens authentication in this yeah, case. Yeah, it's, it's a JSON web token authentication specifically for this demo. There was a little bit of web stuff here, so it's an appropriate piece. Uh, obviously in a real production mobile piece, OAuth would have been a, a more appropriate choice. So uh, when we call this, I think it has like um, half an hour expiration, so it's been more than that since I last log in, logged in, so I do need to log in. Oh. Unlock to save this login. Wow. You oh, didn't get the I, I credentials I, right. Yeah, I think the password was not right. There you there go. There we go. Please no blue screen, right? So, um, so you can see this is the consolidated API, right? It gives you the very short metadata about what you're actually looking for, about the shipment, and then it's the list of the shipments where for each shipment you only get the latest status, like the bare minimum that the mobile application needs, no bloat, no multiple queries. So this is meant to represent the amount of data you need to paint that first screen full, right? You make one API call, again, it's all about that user experience. 
It's about getting the user-centric kind of API. Regardless of what your back-end composition might entail, the user experience is a simpler single call. Yeah. And this is also an answer to a question that we actually get often, right? Remember when I earlier was talking about jobs-oriented API design, right? And how you want to design what people are, how you want to design to the jobs that people are actually trying to solve, right? That means very user-centric design. And that's, a, that's the best phase to put uh, out uh, to your clients, to the API clients. But it may not be the most efficient uh, way to design the backend services, right? So you absolutely need the composition layer to translate between the two to um, maintain the operational agility of having reusable backend services while also delivering that promise of our public APIs are going to be very user-centric, tailored to what users are trying to get done. So Jay now is going to show you, um, so, so this is basic, this was basically our goal to get to this endpoint. We showed that it, it works, it's real, it's not a screenshot. But so the first thing I wanted to show was just that the console integration is specifically based on a new feature in 9.0, um, the scheduler. So I'm not sure if anyone's seen our 9.0 release, but you have the ability to call a service on a time schedule, cron jobs, if you will. But the idea is then you can fill local um, components, local caches, uh, context variables, cluster properties, that kind of stuff, on a time task, pre-fill caches. Suddenly, you don't need to worry about what your cache latency is. It's always up to date. So this particular piece calls the API that console exposes to get the list of what's available and fills in a cluster property to do so, right? So that means that that's available in other policies to then route to. That's how we implement the console, console integration. It's really just this one um, policy. That and the scheduler, and we've got everything we need. That's <coughs> the first piece. The second piece is just the usual kinds of authentication. So this is really standard. This is just the way you just you do JWTs. This is really easy. A little bit of stuff. Then, the, yeah, the XML of them. Just pop them in. Where you go. So this is a fair amount of work. I will do that. It's using JSON interp interpretation, all that kind of stuff. And the other part that it's doing down here, come on you, is it's got two sections of policy, one of which is disabled. The reason why is when we were developing it here, we did it both serially and um, in parallel. So this is uh, actually the, um, come on, where are we here? Yeah, so we, Right here, we're showing the two different pieces. It's also using the um, round robin <coughs> strategies for, for doing load balancing and stuff like that. There's a, a little bit beyond uh, section here to go through this line by line, so we're not going to. But um, just to show that this policy is some of the complexity that we said we could not avoid. But it puts it here, rather than each of the every single one of the services. And as one of my customers said quite recently, it's really important to not duplicate your business logic. And by having all of the complexity around the different service compositions, as uh, I was just asked a couple of minutes ago, putting it here, rather than each of the services, you're not duplicating your business logic. The business logic of looking up an individual tracking ID, for instance, isn't duplicated. The um, business logic of looking up a user's um, information is not duplicated. And that's another port important thing about these pieces. You've got actually less duplication of code. We have one customer I've talked to quite a few times, and they've got three copies of the same business logic around enforcing certain things. Because they've got their old mainframe code, they've got their new web code, and now they've got the mobile stuff. What do they do? And so composing it into microservices is one of the ways you can reduce the number of the pieces you have under management. Okay. 